I'm Melissa Idris. And I'm Sherrod Kutin. Welcome to Consider This, the show where we want you to consider and then reconsider the news of the day. All right, we begin with a video that went viral over the weekend. Now, it showed members of a group called Sarawak for Sarawakians refusing to stand up while Nagaraku played in the background. Now, netizens had criticised the group for being disrespectful. They, however, the group that is, have said that... Um, they, they say that Nagaraku is, quote-unquote, not our anthem. What do you make of this? Well, Melissa, you know, the, the noise in Malaysia Baru continues. And I guess, you know, if we want to embrace democracy, we're going to have to embrace some of the noise. And it's an opportunity to have some things clarified as to what is it that we want a democracy to mean in this country. Now, mm. the Sarawakians uh, for Sarawak uh, is, or Sarawak for Sarawakians, is a group that's been around for some time and it's been pushing uh, for kind of a state rights a politics, a kind of... Uh, it's uh, something that I think a lot of uh, peninsula Malaysians are kind of tone deaf to, right? We don't quite appreciate what Sarawakians are about, why they're upset uh, with the, the way that the Federation, in their perception, has treated them. They feel marginalised, they feel betrayed, they feel right. exploited. Okay, so what you're saying is that we should actually just look beyond the simple facts of this case, right? Look beyond the fact that they did not want to stand up for the Nagarku, you know, the politics of sitting down, so to speak. What essentially is at the, the root of this um, issue is the general disappointment, if I may, about uh, with the Federation over the perceived treatment of Sabah and Sarawak over the years. Right. So now we have a group of netizens, and I'm, I'm assuming many of them are actually from the peninsula, saying these individuals should be punished. Now, it's interesting because until recently, I had no idea that there are laws that are specific to uh, not respecting the anthem. Mm. You can be fined up to 100 ringgit and jailed not more than one month for such an offence. I'm not quite sure if many people have actually been charged in the past, but there are some things to consider when pushing for such action. Because you want to push for punitive action, you must be willing to wait, uh, sorry, to accept that there might be unintended consequences. Such as? Well, people will see these individuals as martyrs within the constituency. The question is how broad this right. constituency is. They might be seen as martyrs to the cause and in fact might inflame the sense of being marginalised and now being punished. Right. Right? Instead of uh, what it was intended to do, which is create genuine loyalty. Right. So the idea of this law is to not show disrespect to the national anthem uh, for the sake of quote-unquote loyalty. Yeah. So the question is, what do, you, do we want people to conform because of a fear of a law that the police action be taken against them or do we want people and have genuine uh, dialogue that strengthens a sense of mutual uh, mutuality mm. which is what a nation <coughs> depends on right? so you know it begs the question then why is this law even around right so the idea to respect the national anthem I mean, it brings me back to uh what is it in the u.s about a couple of years ago they, there was their quarterback uh, was it Co colin kaepernick who refused to stand during uh, the star spangled banner and that was essentially became a hugely divisive issue for the country and it said that by by kneeling during the uh, star spangled banner it disrespected not only the anthem, it disrespected the flag, and it disrespected the people who risked their lives uh, defending the U.S. Yeah, is so that the, the well, same well, that's thing? very emotive because there are a lot of people, especially African Americans, who risked their lives, uh, sacrificed their lives for a nation that didn't, in fact, uh, protect them. And so, do we have the it, same? It, are there well, parallels I don't know. To I mean, Malaysian in fact, story? you have you know the older story of the uh, Olympics or the Olympians, mm. American Olympians, who held up the fist, the Black Power fist, the Black Panther fist, mm. uh, during the medal ceremony. So, look, the point of this is, why is that law even in place? Should we have laws that force a formal uh, loyalty upon the citizens rather than suggest that, uh, that these matters are for discussion, uh, they're issues of persuasion, and that ultimately they are about how people feel genuinely about their country? 
Well, moving on to other issues in the news, the issue of succession of prime ministership, that is back in the news. Although I have to say, Sharad, it feels as though it never left the news in the first place. Now, uh, we have Pakatan Harpan's youth chief, Syed Sadiq, weighing in on the matter, saying that PH's agreement with Tun Dr. Mahathir, uh, on Dr. Tun Dr. Mahathir Muhammad handing over power to Anwar Ibrahim does not stipulate a time period of two years. So we're coming down to the nitty-gritty, trying to pinpoint a certain time frame. Well, Sadiq, you know, actually brings up an old argument. It's an argument made by, of course, his side that perhaps fears, you know, a change in leadership at the cabinet level. Uh, SN Rea, mm. uh, you know, a politician from Penang, uh, your home state, Melissa, yes. <laughs> you know, he's also come out and said, let's stop this discussion. We have a by-election to focus on. So there are a lot of people who are saying this is unnecessary. In fact, uh, some uh, we Weeks ago, we discussed uh, Versailles 2.0's Correct. suggestion that the one way to get over this hump, as it were, for the Pakatan Harapan and to uh, instill some sort of stability uh, on this question is to, in fact, to name a very specific date, something that uh, the Prime Minister, Tun Dr. Mate, uh, refuses to do. Yeah, and I, I had thought about this. I mean, what, why is it so important to have a clear handover date? And it, uh, according to the statement by Bursay, with a clear and publicly known transition plan, it would quash rumours and conspiracy theories perpetrated by those who seek to gain from the instability um, and see the breakup for, of the coalition. Now, this, this instability in the breakup of the coalition, it feels to me like this is very concerted efforts by certain camps, right? This Is this, you know, weighing on the minds of everyday Malaysians or is this, you know, a political game of the political elite? Yeah, the political elite, if you remember, 20 years ago, we had uh, Dr. Mahathir and Hanoi Ibrahim in a very tense uh, competition for leadership that led up to, you know, his sacking, the reformatory uh, movement, 20 years in which the country w grappled with the question of moving forward. Yeah. Are we going to see a replay of this? And oh, who God. wants to see a exactly. replay? Especially who benefits from this, having this in the forefront of people's minds? Well, you know, the thing is... It, it is part of the, 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 the promise. The promise was succession. Said Sadiq says it was vague. And in fact, that is a problem. Mm. The, knowing that it's a problem, rather than seeing it as a way of uh, you know, pushing back or kicking this can down the road, Said Sadiq should work towards, and I think take the advice of Berset 2.0, and say, yeah, let's name a date and let's move on from there. All right, well, let's turn our attention now to the upcoming Tanjung PI by-elections. That, that, that parliamentary seat became vacant following the death of the incumbent MP, Mat Farid Mohamed Rafiq, who passed away on the 22nd of September. Now, the research outfit Institute of Political Studies for Change has said in a report that this by-election has the potential for the opposition to test the acceptance of Chinese and Indian voters. Yeah, it's it's a fascinating, uh, you know, kind of impulse, I think, I would say, <laughs> among uh, many political and analysts is to immediately kind of suggest any by-election is a bellwether. Now, we well, know... I think this one could be, especially because well, of the first one after every, the Amana... 90 the, sorry, of, no yeah. 90% of uh, by-elections that we've had have been said to be bellwethers for uh, the politics <laughs> of the true. day. So let's put it this way. Because we had the Amno Pass, uh, you know, coming together, the Umma movement, and because Umma kind of had a slightly schizophrenic um, message, which was that this was really about Malay and Muslim unity, but at the same time, it was also a national one. Right. So they kept... Um, MCA and MIC mm. uh, in the loop. The question is, who's buying the story and what story are they buying about this in a constituency that has, uh, it's a mixed constituency. It is, 57% Malay, 42% Chinese, 1% Indian. So. Right, so it's been traditionally an MCA seat, uh, but now it looks like MCA will not get that. Now, some people read that as being proof that MCA has a subordinate uh, position mm. with regard to the ma two major parties, Amno and PAS. Uh, others might see this as, you know, again, you know, the kind of coalition politics where there are trade-offs and there are compromises, right? So it really depends on where you sit in the political spectrum and how you read this, I think. <laughs> All right, then after this, we're going to be taking a look at the People's Republic of China at 70, its reforms, its achievements and its challenges. Next on Consider This, stay tuned.